Okay, one last thing I want to address here really quickly that uh, will also be very useful in talking about the business cycle, and it's just another way to think about it's just another way to think about inflation is something known as the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money has been around for a long time. It actually uh, goes back to someone I mentioned previously, the economist Irving Fisher. He really popularized this uh, this tool for understanding the movements of money and prices but way back in the early 1900s. And um, the way the theory is usually stated is with this pretty simple equation. MV, as our book, I'll do it the way our book does it. It, uh, it says MV equals PY, where M is the economy's money supply. And for now, you can just think about that as the total volume of money in circulation, both in the form of currency, okay, so dollar bills and coins, and even more so in the form of people's checking accounts. More money actually resides in checking accounts usually than in currency. But both of those are pretty important aspects of the money supply. For now we'll just leave it at that. Okay. V is what's known as the velocity of circulation. I'll come back and define this for you in a minute. I find it's useful to actually use real numbers here. We'll do a little made up simple example with some real numbers. Okay. P is something we're very familiar with. P is the price level. Okay, the price level is indicated by, for instance, a price index like CPI. Okay, P is the price level. In this example, we would be using the broad price and in price level indicator like a G GDP deflator index. Well, that's because Y, if you remember from Unit 2 when we talked about GDP, Y is, in this case, going to be real GDP, factoring out inflation. Why are we factoring out inflation? Well, because we're multiplying it by the price level here. Okay, So real output, real GDP, real output. Think about it in terms of the quantity. The original quantity theory said quantity of goods or quantity of transactions here, quantity of final goods. And technically it was transactions, but we can think about it as the quantity of final goods. Okay. Let's um, let's understand the logic of the quantity theory, and then I'll show you how it's very easy to understand what's happening with inflation here. Okay. What this is saying over here, what we're saying over here is the quantity of money times the velocity of circulation, and for now, velocity of circulation just refers to how what's the frequency with which the money is spent. Okay. That has to equal up to what? Well, what money? what is money spent on? It's spent on final goods, and the value of final goods is their quantity times their price. Okay, So what we have here, you can think of M times V as the value of total spending in the economy. You can think of M times V as the value of total spending in the economy, and you can think of P times Y as the value of sales of final goods. Total spending is spent on final goods. Okay, So this is just looking from a money perspective and this is looking at a goods times price level perspective. Okay. This is an accounting identity. It's actually a three-line equation which means it's an identity. It must be true by definition. The total value of spending is spent on goods. It has to equal the total value of final goods in the economy. All right. Let's work with this velocity concept in a little more detail. I want to uh, show you how to solve for V so you can understand what it means a little, a little easier because velocity is probably the trickiest thing to understand in the quantity theory. MV equals PY. Let's solve for V by dividing both sides by M. V simply equals P times Y divided by M. P times Y, remember, is your total final sales. The value of total final sales of goods divided by the money supply. Well, what this tells you is how often each dollar is spent on average. And let me plug in some real numbers to make this, um, to make a little bit more sense of this. Okay. Let's say, for instance, that P times Y 
and let's just use an index of real production. Let's say we have 200 units of output and the average price is 5. That gives us a total fi value final sales of 1000. Let's say our money supply is $100. And if you want to get really literal, if you want to get really simple here, that could that could be 100 $1 bills. We've got $100. How could $100 buy $1000 over here 5 times 200 is $1000. How could $100 bills buy $1,000 worth of output? Well, we saw when we solve for V, 1,000 divided by 100, we see that V equals 10. Each dollar bill, it's quite simple, each dollar bill has to be spent 10 times. Okay, $100, if, it's, if it cycles 10 times, or if each dollar is spent 10 times in the year, will buy $1,000 worth of goods. Okay, So that's what velocity means. And I like to think of it as the kind of the, um, the number of times the average dollar is spent per year. Okay, we're always talking about yearly rates here. We're talking about yearly GDP, yearly output, we're talking about yearly velocity, the yearly change in the price level, so on and so forth. The yearly average of the money supply. Okay, so on and so forth. All right, so let me let me go back to the main quantity theory then and we can really use this to understand inflation. MV equals PY. What we're observing in inflation is a, a rapid increase in the price level. Okay, So P is going up. Now, P is going up, we've got to think about, well, we've got to keep this equation balanced. What has to be happening to the other factors? Let's take, let's start by taking a look at Y. And of course, we could have no, ch we could have no change needed on this side of the equation, M times V. If we just had Y go down proportionate amount to how much P is going up. Okay, that's possible, but is it likely? Why is output? Okay, output quite simply doesn't change that fast, especially when we're looking at extreme inflation episodes. Let's think about a hyperinflation where the yearly inflation rate is 1,000%. I think I made reference to this kind of inflation earlier. This is this has actually happened many times in world economies. This actually has happened in the U.S. and the United States if you go back and look at the uh, Revolutionary War and then even if you go and look at the U.S. South during the Civil War. Okay, So let's say the price level is going up a thousand percent per year. Can output be going down a thousand percent per year? Um, no, not likely. The worst decline that we've actually seen in the U.S. in the, in, I'm sorry, in the Great Depression, output's going down something approaching the level of minus 10% per year. Okay, That's the worst decline we've ever seen. That's bad, Okay, but that's nowhere close to enough to offset this rapid increase in P. Okay, So the fact that, and that's that's a disaster. Okay, That's a terrible scenario. Usually output's going to go up 2 to 3% per year. Right, so it's, it's and it's going to go up. Okay, so if inflation's going up and output is usually going up, okay, inflation's going up, output is usually going up a little bit, well that wouldn't offset it. Okay, So the thing, the fact of the matter is we have to rule out why is a causal factor, Okay, changes in real output, we have to rule that out as a causal factor in explaining inflation. So okay, let's move to the other side of the equation and we'll think about M and V. Let's go ahead and think about V. You might sense where I'm going with this, but let's play play along. Let's think about V. Let me use green for this. Let's think about V. What would be have to be happening with V to explain the inflation? Well, V would be have to be going up proportionally, and let's say plus one thousand percent in the hyperinflation episode. Or even if we look at let's go in, let's be a little more realistic for U.S. history here. Let's say. Let's look at the highest peacetime inflation we've experienced, and that was I showed you that just a while back, and that occurred in 1980. The highest inflation rate we've seen is 14% rate. That was in early 1980 with our high inflation. That means velocity would have to be going up by a proportional amount. Okay, let's actually look at velocity. Here we have velocity of the M1 money stock going back to 1960, okay, till now, till now. and what we're looking at is the the percent change, okay, so the annual change in the velocity of money, 
and notice going back historically it going back historically it doesn't change a lot it bounces around between 0 to 5% growth per year and it probably averages something like 3% it it ticks up a little bit in the 1970s it does move a little bit and it moves in the same direction of inflation but only a little bit okay and it comes down some in the 1980s when inflation starts to come down it actually starts to decline at a at a minus 10% rate, a minus 5% rate, but then it'll come back up, and then the average trend here, you'll notice over a long period of time, it doesn't move around that much. Okay, It bounces up and down, but the average over a long period of time stays around zero. Now, you'll notice here in this great recession of 2009, the velocity number declines, and it's actually still declining, it's still growing, it's still decreasing, and it's something like 7% per year. Okay. But notice this number over a long period of time is fairly stable for most historical periods. It has moved around quite a bit recently, but most of that movement is in a downward direction recently. Okay, these are negative numbers here. Okay, so velocity recently is moving down. In that 1980 recession, it's not moving that much. It's not moving as much as did inflation, which remember was 14% right here. Okay. So the fact of the matter is empirically we just don't see velocity moving that much. Okay, So what that means is we're going to have to rule out velocity as our causal factor. What does that leave us with? Well that leaves us with the money supply and in terms of the quantity theory of money when we see a big increase in the price level what that means is we're going to have to see a proportional increase in the quantity of money. Well, if we think back to how we initially modeled inflation, which was something like this with the supply and demand diagram, where we had the purchasing power of money on the price axis and then the quantity of money per time period. There's our initial equilibrium purchasing power, our initial equilibrium value of money, and our initial equilibrium quantity. How do we interpret inflation? Very simple. We have the supply of money growing here, supply two, supply one, faster than the demand, and the result is that the PPM declines, the value of money goes down. Remember, as the value of money goes down, the price of all goods goes up. The price level, remember, was the inverse. So the price level goes up. Okay. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We can see it in the supply and demand graph. We can see the exact same result in the quantity theory of money. Okay, so uh, that'll wrap it for Unit 3. We've uh, covered our remaining indicators on employment and inflation in some detail. And now we're ready to uh, start talking about business cycles. So in we'll, uh, a couple weeks, we'll get into Unit 4. We'll talk about what the business cycle is. And then we'll start looking at competing theories of explaining the cyclical ups and downs that we see in the developed economies like the United States. Stay tuned. See you then.